Then, as they approach Mushroom Rock. And that's when things first started to go a little strange. The team is about to confront a crisis like the one that killed Mallory and Irvin. But this time, the ending is up to them. Wednesday, the mission team embarks on a perilous ascent to the summit of Mount Everest. They've received word that they may encounter two dead or dying climbers just below the summit. But now the unexpected happens. Dave, Tap, and Jason are shocked to find three unknown climbers sprawled by Mushroom Rock. Russians who've been exposed to the horrors of a night out on Everest. And they were just semi-reclined and sort of moaning and rocking. They were uh, in the early stages of cerebral edema and that was a big worry. So here they were at 28,000 feet. Meanwhile, they knew that there were two more climbers a little higher up that were in desperate straits. Uh, take his oxygen and his mask, send them down right now. Just make a decision and do it. We made a decision on the radio to give these guys oxygen. In fact, we uh, literally liberated a bottle of oxygen from one of the Sherpas and sent him down and gave it to the Russians. With precious time ticking away, the team attempts to get the Russians back on their feet. They try every trick in the book. We gave them water and food, and generally we just slapped them around a lot. Meanwhile, Eric Simonson receives an update on the two climbers stranded high on the third step. Just this is Eric. Just gonna let you guys know that when you get up to the summit, I even know it's Andy Lapkin. The guide risking his life to stay with his client is an admired colleague. Andy Lapkus. Andy Lapkus, uh, he's certainly a, a big name in climbing and, uh, and in guiding. Solid reputation. That was his 23rd Himalayan expedition. He's definitely had some stature. Andy, the American guide who we know, who's a good guy and who we, wanna, we want him to live. Dave sends Tap, Jason, and Fudorji ahead while he stays with the Russians, trying to get them going. I stayed with these guys uh, for at least a half an hour longer to try and get them up and viable. And when I finally left them, I did feel like they could make some progress downward themselves. In base camp, Eric adjusts his game plan. With the team's oxygen supplies dwindling, he pulls the plug on the search of the lower slopes. I got in touch with Andy Pollitz at Camp 6 and told him, Andy, I want you to suit up and head up. High on the third step, six hours into their ascent, the expedition team finally locates Andy Lapkus and Jaime Vinales. Whipped by wind and sub-zero temperatures, deprived of supplemental oxygen overnight, the two men are in shocking shape. Weak, delirious, and near blind. They didn't even realize we were anywhere near them until we were about 10 feet away. They had... Uh started to take off their clothes. Uh, in particular, Andy had taken his mittens off, his parka was unzipped. The climbers are suffering from paradoxical undressing, a form of dementia that causes people to strip off their clothes when in fact they are freezing to death. And they're still not responding when Dave Hahn arrives from helping the Russian team. But it, it wasn't working and it was pretty obvious it wasn't working. I was still thinking that maybe uh, our guys could continue on to the summit and help them on the way down. I remember Eric on the radio asking us, what are you guys going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going for the top? you got to go now. The team has to decide. Do they make this rescue attempt? Their oxygen supplies are depleted. The weather is unpredictable. If they don't go to the summit today, they won't have another shot. We kind of looked at each other. And we were all going, you know, what happens now? Make a decision. Come on, you guys. You got to go. Go, go, go. Conditions are perfect. The team is strong. And the summit is less than an hour away. The sun was up. There was virtually no wind. We were looking right up at the summit of Everest. And it seemed like if you could ever count on perhaps getting it done, that, that this might be it. I think we were all looking at each other 
thinking we're not going to the summit, and I think Dave vocalized it. He said, you guys, we can't do it. And both Tap and I agreed readily. I mean, it was it was pretty obvious. It's just somebody needed to say it, and, and Dave stepped up. I was almost in tears. They were close to it as well, but not because they couldn't go to the summit. It was more because uh, these guys were in rough shape, and we really didn't know how the situation was going to come out. They told me these guys were so trashed that there was no way they were going anywhere without direct physical intervention. They were very clear that these guys were going to die unless they helped them. In one brief instant, their forensic expedition becomes a rescue mission. Other teams are on the mountain, but none offer oxygen. Fudorji boldly offers his own bottles of oxygen and sets off down the mountain with no oxygen at all. And the investigators, now rescuers, do everything they can for Jaime and Andy. Some eight hours into their climb, Jason and Tap finally get Andy on his feet and start back down the mountain. Andy was obviously suffering. It was a painful thing because he was still the kind of guy you look up to. We'd go five steps until Andy's legs would just give out and he would collapse and we'd take a break, and then we'd go another five steps and do it all over again. But as bad as Andy looks, Jaime may be worse. Jaime, we weren't sure about. Dave was gonna stay with Jaime and see how that went. With Andy draped between them, Jason and Tap trudged slowly away from the summit. And all this time, I was thinking, how are we gonna get him down the second step? I mean, it's, it's a series of three rope repels. Walking on a flat trail is one thing, but Getting down the second step is a totally different story. At the second step, Tap goes down first. Jason helps Andy clip in and start to descend. At a critical moment, Andy is struck blind. I was on this ledge receiving him coming down, and uh, he said, I can't see you, where are you? Above them, still at the third step, Dave is engaged in a life or death struggle with the listless Jaime. He's carrying his oxygen bottle and my own and uh, had him connected on a little hose. And he was walking just behind me, but he kept stopping and taking rests. And we kept sitting down and taking rests. And pretty soon we were a long ways behind uh, Tap and Jason and Andy Lapkus. I remember at one point I asked him, he said, Jaime, you have, you have a family, don't you? And he said, oh yes, my, my wife, my wife is pregnant right now. That made me cry, and it didn't make Jaime worried in the least. He just took for granted that he was gonna live, and I just couldn't understand how he was gonna manage if he couldn't walk. Despite Dave's heroic efforts, time and oxygen are running out. If he can't get Jaime moving faster, Dave himself will soon be at risk. At base camp, Eric is growing increasingly worried. Andy and Jason and Tap made reasonably good progress down from the third step and down the second step, but Dave, who was back with Jaime, moved at an agonizingly slow pace. And it became obvious to me that at the pace that they were moving, Dave wasn't gonna get down with Jaime. First and foremost, my job was to get our team members home safe and sound. So. Uh, I took that job very seriously, even if it meant making some tough decisions. I heard Eric coming on the radio, and I took the radio out of my down suit where, where only I could hear it, and held it out in front of Jaime because I knew what Eric was going to say. It's been more than 10 hours since Dave left Camp 6. With the safety of his own climber in mind, Eric gives a brutal order. If Jaime can't get going, Dave has to leave him on the mountain. With their dreams of solving mountaineering's greatest mystery in ruins, the team struggles to save the lives of two deathly ill climbers and not lose their own. With time and oxygen running out, expedition leader Eric Simonson gives climber Dave Hahn a brutal order. Dave 
If Jaime can't make it on his own, just leave him. Jaime's reaction is immediate. Somehow the words penetrated his, his brain and he realized he needed to get moving. Jaime said that was really the first point that he remembered clearly and he remembered clearly being mad at Eric. And that fired him up and it was just in time because he had to rappel down the second step. But now, after hours of hard work on the mountain, even the veteran Dave feels the strain. I was getting pretty tired, pretty wiped out. Jaime needed more help. At crisis point, unexpected help materializes. Ferber Sherpa, from Jaime Vinal's original team, has raced up more than 2,000 feet to lend a hand. This great burst of energy and enthusiasm reordered Jaime's face mask and got his goggles situated on him. And together we started uh, really being able to make a difference. Dave helps Jaime down to Mushroom Rock, where they catch up with the rest of the team, including Andy Politz, who brings as much oxygen as he can carry. It's just so encouraging to see Andy Politz there, strong as ever, uh, enthusiastic, take charge. I started to think it didn't really matter that I was tired and that I was wearing out. It looked like we were going to pull off this day. But the relief is short-lived. 14 hours into the expedition-turned-rescue mission, the group enters the series of rocky ledges known as the Yellow Band. I saw a couple guys down at the bottom of the rope laying there, and I knew that if I tried to go down the rope at that point, I'd knock rocks down on them. So I'm yelling at them, get out of the way, get out of the way. The team is horrified to discover two of the three Russians they tried to help earlier. One has collapsed. The other is trying to revive him. From base camp, expedition doctor Lee Myers relays instructions through Eric. His skin was still warm when I rolled up his sleeve to check his pulse. Now Lee says that uh, if he doesn't have a carotid pulse, uh, he's probably dead. The one other thing you could do would be uh, pull his sunglasses off and see if his pupils contract with the sunlight. There wasn't any change in his pupils once we opened his eyelids. And at that point, we figured he was done. Yeah, at least says he's dead. The Russian climber is dead. I remember before that standing at the top of the yellow band and looking out over the Tibetan plateau and thinking how incredible it was that Andy and Jaime are going to, you know, live through the day, or at least it seemed, and what an amazing thing. It's a tough thing to take, seeing a full-grown Siberian man crying. You know, there was nothing we could do, and we just had to get him down. He, he wanted to stay with his friend, but we told him he had to go down. As the others make their way down the mountain, Dave Hahn stays behind. He has one more difficult task to accomplish. Out of respect to him, I didn't want him to be in a spot where people had to climb right over him. So I unclipped him from where he was attached to the mountain, and I moved him off that ledge, which means that he fell down 